do. Wow, this is a very uh, inspirational event, I think, this startup day, or days. Uh, first time for me in Estonia, and you know, certainly then also in Tartu, but uh, although it's chilly outside, I feel very warm welcome otherwise. Uh, and, and see uh, all the creativity going around here uh, is very inspirational. I hope to be able to give another kind of inspiration. I don't have a, maybe a startup ID myself, but maybe some of you can get some ID for a new startup, how you can help us to go more in space or utilize the space uh, for, for, for uh, a business case. Uh, so basically, I will tell you my story how I became an astronaut, my space flights, and a bit what we do in space, and uh, towards the end I'll uh, tell you a bit of the future human space flight, unless I ran out of time before that, we'll see. <laughs> so I uh, grew up in Stockholm uh, and um, took, uh, got a master in engineering physics at the KTH Royal Institute of Technology. I also always loved to travel, uh, so I took a year off there and actually sailed across the Atlantic, which might have been a good uh, to have on my CV when I eventually applied to become an astronaut. But uh, then I continued for so physics was really fun and studied more physics. And uh, I got a PhD in, in experimental particle physics, came to CERN, where I worked a couple of years as a researcher, preparing for these huge uh, accelerator experiments down there now which uh, looking for new particles. A couple of years ago, they found this Higgs boson that you may uh, have heard of. I thought that was really fun, and I uh, didn't have any idea to want to do anything else uh, until the day a friend of mine said, hey, Chris, I found a new job for you. I don't need a new job. I said, I do research in physics. What's going to be more fun? Well, he said, they're looking for astronauts. I thought, was, I thought he was joking, but the next day he actually gave me this... Uh, ad he cut out from the newspaper. European Space Agency is looking for up to 10 astronauts. Wow. There was a chance to go to space. Something which I, at that time, had been thinking of for at least 10 years, that if there's ever a chance to go to space, then I have to take it. But I had no idea how to do it. I didn't even know that uh, there were astronauts in Europe before I did it. So I worked hard to get a good application. Uh, this was good enough. I was called into interviews, tests, medical tests, many strange kind of tests. A procedure actually took almost two years until uh, in May 1992, I got a phone call that had become one of only six new European astronauts. And then things went fast. Already two weeks later, they wanted us to start to work in Germany, where we had astronaut, the European Astronaut Center. Barely had I arrived there before they told me, we probably have to go to Russia soon. Russia, I said. No one had talked about Russia during all these two years of interviews and stuff. But as you very well know here, it has changed a lot in Europe in the early 90s. Uh, and there was an opportunity to work with Russia, and sure enough, uh, another year later, in '93, I moved to Russia with my family, and I can tell you my wife was even less eager to go to Russia. <laughs> but we had a couple of very interesting years in, in, in Russia. I was uh, training uh, to be able to go to the then Russian space station Mir with the Soyuz capsule. It was a lot of uh, training events, like here, if you land in the water, you have to be able to jump out uh, of it in, in your uh, spacesuit. A lot of things which may look difficult, but for me the most difficult was that I had to learn Russian. Everything was in Russian there. I didn't know a word Russian when told me to go to Russia. I now know that Estonian is even more difficult language than Russian, but uh, this was hard enough for me. But uh, uh, in the end, I was not the guy who went to space with this, I just became the backup, uh, which was not so fun, but more fun and uh, always satisfying when you have to work hard, you eventually can overcome it. And that is that today I'm more, I speak fairly good Russian. So it's something I got out of that. Instead, I was sent to United States of America, to Texas, to Houston, where NASA has its astronaut center, the Johnson Space Center. And I became a member of the largest uh, NASA astronaut class ever. 
and uh, we were 44, nine of us so-called foreigners, and we became so crowded in the offices, so we got the class name, the Sardines, whereupon someone got a very good slogan for us, for Sardines, space is no problem. <laughs> but as you see here, it became a very long line, and who ended up at the very end of that line? I was a uh, younger version of me, uh, for, so it took some more time until it still was my chance to go to space. But it's uh, anyhow very fun to be an astronaut, even when you go to space. You do a lot of interesting stuff. You train in very exciting environments, like under the water. I was going to do eventually spacewalk, and we trained that a lot underwater because you can balance the spacesuit. You don't float up, you don't sink down. Uh, you're an English neutral buoyant. That's why this pool, which is 60 meters by 30 meters by 12 meters, is called the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory. And there we can kind of work a bit like in weightlessness. And it's large, so we can have full-size models. This was the space shuttle. It's not flying anymore. Here's some parts of the space station. And you do there over and over again what your data will do in space. You also get to fly aircraft. Yeah, actually, some, one of the first things I had to learn as an astronaut that first year in, in, in Germany was to get both a dive license and a pilot license for future trainer late, uh, training later. Uh, this aircraft, uh, flashy jet called T-38, though I was never allowed to fly myself. I was always a uh, co-pilot in the back seat there. And that is, by the way, is a selfie well before the concept of selfie existed. And it was, uh, don't even, we didn't even have these uh, smartphones at those times. Uh, but this aircraft is not only a means for the astronauts as a training means, uh, it's also a transportation uh, mean. So, uh, as I mentioned, we were mainly living and training in Houston, Texas. But I'm sure many of you know where they launched the uh, big rockets in the U.S. That's in Florida at the Kennedy Space Center. And there's some 1,500 kilometers between them. And we often had to go there for training also. And then we flew ourselves with this aircraft. It took just uh, an hour and a half. And when it's finally... Finally, it was time to go to space for real. Fourteen and a half years after I'd been selected as an astronaut. We, the crew, we flew ourselves from Houston to uh, Kennedy Space Center at Cape Canaveral with these aircrafts. We made a turn around the launch pad here where our shuttle was waiting for us. Uh, and then we landed on a long runway, which is just a few kilometers away. A runway where the normal the shuttles would return after the flights to space, weather permitting. Uh, a few days later, it was uh, then the 9th of December, 2006, local time, uh, we uh, boarded the shuttle, uh, and uh, there was a few guys up here who helped us into the shuttle, uh, helped us into the seats, then they closed the hatch, and then they went far away. No one wanna be close to the shuttle when it starts, it's dangerous. Well, that is say, unless you are up here, of course, if you are there laying on your back and you kind of almost sleep. Now, if you can I increase the sound, yes, have to feel it. You wake up then, for sure. And when the boosters are ignited, then you know you go somewhere, hopefully all the way to space. It's shaky, both physically and psychologically. But mainly I was just happy, happy, finding a way to space after 14 and a half years. It's huge stuff, 2,000 tons, which goes to space. And you could say it's about 50 million horsepower. Which you can point out when someone brags about his new car with a few hundred here steps. After two minutes, these boosters on their side, they had done their job. They separated, actually fell down in the Atlantic with parachutes, could in principle be re re reused. Then the ride gets smoother. It's not so shaky anymore. But the acceleration increases, the G-forces increases, and the last minute, you have a 3G acceleration. You weigh three times more than normal. But so, only eight and a half minutes after takeoff, the engine stops, and in a split second, you are in weightlessness. You unstrap, you float out, and a new way of life starts. Two days after launch, we approached and docked with the space station, which at the time 
had three people living on board and basically was more or less exactly half completed in building. And our main task during this mission was to continue building the space station, which we did all on the following day with the first spacewalk. This part here, we had with us up in the shuttle, and uh, it was brought out to the end of the space station, as it was then, with robotic arms. We worked on it, prepared it, we used this kind of uh, battery-driven bolt drivers and secured it in place. The, crew is go the following day, we were going space. to retract some solar Out arrays by command from the inside. Ready, but ready, it didn't now. work out as planned. It didn't want to fold up. And this became a problem which the ground control main had to try to figure out. How Good. can this be solved? And while they were thinking, we were continuing working up there with what we had planned and trained for a couple of years now. And during the second spacewalk, where we were recon reconnecting uh, electrical circuits, among other things, to see the camera out there, working up the airlock. It's a Soyuz capsule, which the crew up there had with them. And then it's all nice to tell your friends what you're doing. And well, this is actually the Crown Princess of Sweden. I had a little chat with her. And I was showing a little frisbee trick, what you can do in weightlessness. Unfortunately, they didn't allow it as a, acknowledge it as a world record, so it was cheating to do it in weightlessness. And then we were asked to go outside to do an extra spacewalk to solve this solar ray problem. It was a great, fun challenge. We had not trained for it, but with the help of the mission control specialists, where all the smart guys and girls are working, it worked out. And really, it's kind of unfair that the astronauts go to all, get all the attention on them because thousands of people are working for every mission and they are the smart people. You're just the kind of actor up there. And uh, here we are, to, in before we were allowed to come back, we had a few uh, experiments to deploy into space from the space station, uh, from the shuttle. And this was going to study uh, the atmosphere still up there, 700 kilometers. And so, 13 days after we left Florida, we are back in Florida. Our command did a great uh, touchdown there on this long runway I mentioned, uh, two days before Christmas. And it was good he could do that, because the shuttle, when it came back for landing, it didn't have any engines at that time. It was really a glider, and a very clumsy glider. And you only have one chance to do a good landing. But he did. And uh, indeed, it was everything was... Uh, perfect almost. We had these problems, we overcome them. Uh, and uh, this photo actually ended up on a website for uh, travels. And uh, someone had called it the travel picture of the year 2006, uh, which I can agree to. And the funny thing is also that uh, during the comments fields, someone, someone written, oh no, that is obvious fake photoshopping. That's too good to be true. But I'd like to say, no, I was there, so I know it's true. And uh, what you see here is New Zealand, by the way, the South Island, North Island. You also can see a little bit how we work. We call it space walk. We're not walking. We're climbing here with your uh, hands on the handrail. And like climbing a mountain, be safe. So we have safety tethers. You don't get lost in space, things like that. Well, I got one more uh, flight to space. That's what the ESA kind of allowed me. And here I'm on my way to the second launch coming out to the crew quarters where we live in, in a quarantine for the last week, so we don't get up there with some uh, bugs in space. Uh, like my first flight, I was flying, launching with uh, six Americans in the shuttle, but it was a uh, completely different crew this time. And this is so-called Astro Van who drives us to, to the uh, shuttle. And this is how that launch looked like. It was exactly midnight local time. So down here was the 28th of August 2009, and a few minutes over here is the 29th of August. And it's not that we're crashing down. We go up, and then we get the speed. We need about 28,000 kilometers per hour to stay in orbit, so we don't fall down on Earth again. And so we go around the Earth, and as you know, the Earth is round. So you see we fall in the <laughs> Earth here. Two days later, we are now approaching the space station for the second time. And this is Nicole Stott. We're going to leave her up there. She's checking out her new home. And now the space station was more or less fully assembled. Brought to ECS this 0.07. Is, now we can maybe so take HHS down a little bit of sound. This is one of the most exciting uh, yeah, moments of the flight in addition to landing okay. and uh, start on landing. It's, it's exactly a docking. Here's the space yeah. station. And this is the shuttle approaching. This is a docking mechanism to connect it. The commander here now. 
He's flying himself manually. And he has to aim, he has to not fast, not too slow. All seven of, all of us on board are helping out one way or another on flight deck. Th that's me, I'm as responsible for this docking mechanism. I'm also focusing a camera he's looking at. Really the station is up there, but he's looking at the camera screen. So he's kind of aiming for this. Good closure. Fire. Now I have connection to the space station, but we still wait That's for right. signals right. that everything's okay. Yes, we got it there. Everything's fine. I was happy. In particular, commander would have been very embarrassing for him if he hadn't failed, got to go home. But it worked out, and we can then uh, open the hatch into the space station, which now, when it was fully assembled, had a permanent crew of six people. And the commander at the time there was a Russian, Gennady Padalka. And here he's ringing the bell. That signifies there's coming guests on board. It doesn't happen so often, so I think it's a little bit fun. Uh, Gennady is, by the way, the current world record holder of accumulated time in space. 878 days he's been in space in total, over five long missions. In addition to Gienna, there was one more Russian up there, Roman, there was two Americans, there was a Canadian, and there was a Belgian ESA colleague of mine, Frank DeWin, there. So, all in all, we were 13 astronauts from five different countries working together on this really international space station for a little bit over a week. Our main cargo this time we had in a module which we connected to the space station temporarily while we were there with the help of this robotic arm here. And in there we had tons of stuff, much of it in, in bags like this, and this is how you can kind of unload in weightlessness. This is coming out of this uh, temporary module into one of the so-called nodes where you have doors in six directions. And here it goes into the uh, Japanese laboratory. There's several laboratories up there, and much of this stuff here is really scientific equipment. One experiment was a little bit special, so we had to have that in the cabin of the shuttle. So in that box there was actually six mice. We're going to study how their bones get uh, weakened in space. That's something which happens with our human bones, and we need to understand it better, and we can do it a little bit more invasive with mice. Here I'm doing my first spacewalk on this flight. The box I'm holding there, it weighs 850 kilograms. So I brag, you have to be strong, right? <laughs> okay, it's weightlessness, so it's more a question of controlling it. I, actually, it was a tank of ammonia. Ammonia is used as a fluid to transfer the heat which is generated inside to radiators so you can kind of then uh, get it out into space. Frank Devin, or showing how you can handle things in weightlessness also. He later became the first commander on the space station who was neither from the U.S. nor from the Russia. So those are the two countries who kind of owns most of the space station, pays most, and therefore also most of the astronauts. This is fun to do when you get used to weightlessness. Before that, you, you can easily get a bit uh, sick in your stomach if you're not careful. As Nicole uh, showing a new way of bunny jumping. The last uh, evening, we gathered all 13 of us around one of the small tables uh, on the space station for a little farewell dinner. And this is typically how food is uh, it in bags and uh, tins, eat straight out, out of it. You can bring a bit of your own food. This is actually Swedish cookies, uh, which I was uh, treating my friends with up there, and it's uh, how you treat them in weightlessness. <laughs> that is, if you can catch it. <laughs> And then a final farewell drink. What we're toasting in there, I learned with Tervasex, right, is uh, uh, mainly urine. So we are recycling the water up to an 885% so we can drink uh, again. And then we left the space station and got maybe the most beautiful and also emotional, nice uh, picture of the space station my whole flight. We were flying with a shuttle on 200 meters distance around the station. I see this fabulous construction floating there, 350 kilometers above Earth. I've been so fun, I was so proud. I've been part of building it in place. I had a chance to be there, fun with my friends, but I'm a little bit sad also because my boss has had a long time already said, this is your last flight to space. 
Well, I have to be happy anyhow, and I am. And uh, it's really a fabulous uh, construction up there, uh, which has been built like a Lego in space while also orbiting Earth. It takes only 90 minutes to go one orbit around the Earth. And the first part there was launched in 1998. And in, uh, towards the end of 2000, it was large enough to have permanent crew, which it has had now for over 18 years. And uh, in the beginning, normally three people, now normally six people. It's large, it's a little bit 100 meters, that's about 80 meters, 450 tons. And we have built this because we want to learn how this to build and live and work in space for future. But it also offers unique uh, research science opportunities. So we built it as a laboratory. And in addition to the views up and down, it's really the weightlessness which can be utilized to study phenomena in new ways and can learn new things in physics, in biology, in medicine. Uh, like uh, things behave differently. You don't have convection in weightlessness. Uh, kind of looks like this because warm air is lighter and colder and you get in an air connection uh, circle like that. Well, it doesn't matter that the warm air is light in weightlessness. So you don't get the air uh, connection so you can maybe study things less in less disturbance. Medicine is pro actually the biggest research area at least was involves the astronauts up there. And it's almost every day experiments are done with astronauts up there. So you're really a guinea pig. And uh, this is because uh, all, almost all our systems in the body got affected by space, in particular weightlessness, and a lot in negative ways. Bones get weakened, muscles get weakened, the immune system gets weakened. Some people come back with uh, uh, impaired vision. We don't understand why yet. And we need to learn this and understand and found countermeasures for the future space life. But we also learn new things about our bodies which we can help, uh, which can be used by medical doctors or nurses to help people here who are sick uh, in the future. Here's another um, two pictures showing what ha can happen with your body in space. Uh, this is me just before my second launch, and you see I start to get a bit old, wrinkles in my face here, and then get to space, and a lot of wrinkles get away. You look younger and more beautiful. Now, unfortunately, of course, the effect doesn't st uh, stay when you come back. But th the, the reason for this is that here on Earth, the um, weight pulls the body fluids down in, in the legs. Well, in weightlessness, it doesn't. So you get the fluid shift up, so you get more fluffy in your face. But you may feel like you have a cold, so it's not uh, so, so nice, really. So I will now tell you a little bit about living in space, uh, the kind of daily uh, life. And I already mentioned that we reuse water as much as can. I mean, we, so we try to also uh, basically recircle as much as possible. We even start now to grow food up there, not because they're too, so hungry, but to experiment what you can do. This was the first lettuce crop a couple of years ago. But then he was not allowed to eat it. I had to go down to analy anal analysis on Earth first to make sure it was OK. Well, a third of our life, we sleep away, and uh, we do that in space also. How do you do it? You put your sleeping bag somewhere where no one else has put his or her sleeping bag. You float into it, and then you try to fall asleep. Um, it took me some time to really get used to fall asleep in weightlessness. I like to feel the bed. You don't feel the bed, however you turn around. Uh, but once you fall asleep, you sleep well. You don't wake up with your arm in a strange position, for example. And it's good you can sleep a little bit anyway. Like in shuttle, there were seven people sleeping in the same little uh, area or volume space. Uh, so you see I'm upside down like a bat in the ceiling. It's along the wall. They're sticking out from the tunnel, which eventually leads to the space station when you dock there. Space station is large, though. There's plenty of space there. So when we docked, I took my stuff and I moved into the European laboratory, Columbus. There was no one sleeping there. Because those on the space station, they actually each have their... A uh, little cabin where they can uh, sleep, uh, and uh, this is how it looks, though. But was one of the cabins was still missing the doors around it. it was coming up later, and there was a Canadian who had to sleep there. I guess it was him because Canada is the land, they are the partner p pay lease to the space station, so <laughs> he got into there. hygiene. That's another complicated uh, thing. You, there's no shower up there. It's a very cheap hotel. And that's because it's very hard to make a shower when water doesn't fall down. Uh, and, and anyone who can come up with a good solution to that, that's an idea for a startup company, actually, because they have tried to make a fan to blow water, but it 
turned out into kind of a Turkish sauna, so they gave it up. Um, but uh, what you do, well, you take a little towel, you can put some wood on that, and that's how you, you clean yourself, and you can spit your toothpaste into it and then throw it away. Uh, other complicated daily life things, if you have to want to, if you have for six months, you may want to cut your hair now and then, but then you have to be careful so that the hair doesn't, it doesn't fall down on the floor, right? It would float up in your cabin, you can get it in your eyes, your mo mouth, your nose, so uh, here it is, uh, Tim and Nicole put cutting the hair of Roman, and they put the, the vacuum cleaner hose to the sister to come so you can suck it up. It's a lot of daily things you have to think of, which is different in space. Another very important thing is exercise. It's always important, but in weightlessness, you, you don't use muscles at all. Even when you sit, you use some muscles, and you get some, uh, also for your bones, some uh, stimulation. So you're body will deteriorate very, very quickly. And that's fine as long as you're up there. But when you come back, you will be a wreck if you don't exercise properly. So on the daily schedule, which the crew get, there's twice uh, physical workout. It's part of your work, actually. And there's a couple of uh, various uh, exercise equipments up there, like a treadmill to run here, but then you have to connect yourself so you don't uh, float away but when you run. Uh, this is uh, Sunny Williams, by the way. She came up with me on my first space flight to space. And uh, she actually ran a marathon up there. At the same time as they ran the, ma I think it was the New York Marathon. Uh, but while they only ran 42 kilometers in New York, she ran three orbits around Earth. <laughs> that would be better. Uh, this sophisticated thing here is for strength training, which you normally use weights with but you cannot use weights in weightlessness, that's kind of useless. Uh, so this gives the same kind of resistance, and since that came into use, ast astronauts come back to Earth after even half a year up in, in better shape. Even the shuttle, we had a little tre treadmill, uh, bike, sorry, ergometer. Uh, although two weeks in space is not critical. Uh, you don't have to work out every day, but it's always nice. So good we had it also on the shuttle. I already mentioned a little bit about the food. And uh, this is actually a photo on the same uh, dinner as you saw the, the, the video before. So you do eat the same kind of food as on Earth. Meat and vegetables, fish, uh, etc. But it has to be uh, preserved so it can last for up to half a, a year without being in a, in a fridge even. We don't have a uh, cooler for food. And you cannot prepare it. There's no way to fry or cook meat and uh, food up there. So you, and you cannot put it on plate, it will float away, so that's why you eat straight out of it. You can make it somewhat water. Some of the food is in, in uh, vacuum uh, f bags like this, and then you put water in it, and you let it suck up for some minutes, and then you can eat out of it. That water could be warm, so that's one. So I thought it was kind of boring after only six, two weeks. I can just imagine what they think after six months up there. On other, you can do some other alternative things with the food. You're not supposed to play with the food, they say, but <laughs> have to have fun. Normally, if you want to drink, you, you yeah, fill up a bag like this with water. That's from the pantry in the, in the shuttle, by the way. Then you have a straw which you drink out of. Maybe some powder in there to give it uh, taste. But here, I just make it a little mini water world floating around. And then I give it taste with Swedish candy. Uh, anyone who's been in Sweden, we have cars look like that, but I got a special edition of Space Shuttle. One became a submarine. And now, let's see, here's the challenge, my medical experiment. Well, if anyone of you know, understands Swedish, this is the only way to put it in a joke on an old commercial in Sweden. Now, but of course, anything which goes into you have to come out some way also, right? So that is the question so many wants to know and someone doesn't dare to ask, so I'll show you. Not as explicit as other, but the, take it to the visit of the space shuttle toilet. They have a, two similar ones on the space station. Uh, so here we float into the area. By the way, that's the hatch where you enter and, and the shuttle. And uh, then you can get a little bit of privacy by that curtain. And now if you're going to do number one, Americans say, small world, the Russians say, 
in this uh, locker, you have private funnels. On the space station, you have to be a little bit more, uh, uh, so it's only one for everybody. Now we're not, let's see. Maybe you could hear that. When I lifted that hose, automatically it started a fan there, and then you do your work. But that's very easy, it works very easy. It's like a vacuum cleaner. Number two is much more complicated. First of all, you have to make sure you don't float away when you're sitting there working, right? So you secure yourself. There's a little locker. We don't have to, if you must not forget to open that hatch. You only do that once. And then you, again, you start the fan. You're supposed to suck down the thing. The sucking power is not always strong enough. So, yeah, that, 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 that's a disadvantage to go into space. But one of the advantages is really the views. You never get uh, bored by the views from space. And people take photos all the time. Uh, sometimes you recognize where you are easily. This is the Red Sea here, the Nile, Sinai. Sometimes you have to figure out where it is, north and south, etc. This is a famous place, or well known at least. Here is north. So that's Gibraltar here. This is straight to Gibraltar. Sometimes it's just uh, fascinating colors and shapes in the ocean, like this atoll outside Australia. You cannot see the Chinese wall. That is a myth with your bare eyes, but you can see uh, at least effects of human uh, activities or constructions. This is actually an artificial lake. Well, it might look like a piece of art, but uh, here's a river in Cameroon in Africa. It's not a river, and that's been dammed up there and created a sea up in the river arms, and the sun is very low in this glint effect. Otherwise, it's really nighttime. You realize we have a civilization on, on this planet, and um, uh, I thought it was most fascinating. Floating over the Earth in the nighttime was like floating a huge map, and you could see big cities, big blobs, and small blobs, small cities. This is Italy. There's a heel, there's a toe, Sicily, and this big blob here is Naples. You have good eyes, you see the black circle in there. That's Vesuvius, which is national park, so you're not allowed to build anything there. What also strikes you, in addition to you don't see borders, is uh, how thin and fragile the atmosphere really looks like. Uh, what do you see here, this little thin color band, that's our atmosphere. Here's the Earth, here's the space, here's the the rudder, the shuttle, uh, and this is about 100 kilometers, but it's only the 5 percent, the 5 kilometers closest to Earth, where we have enough oxygen to live without a spacesuit or a spaceship. And in, indeed, uh, the Earth is like a huge spaceship for all of humanity, and we really have to take care of it uh, and be careful, and in particular the atmosphere now, we're kind of messing up with putting too much uh, stuff up there. So. Uh, this becomes very apparent uh, when, when you're in space and see these things. And sometimes, maybe best of all, when you really feel like uh, this is your place, that's when you see your home from space. Uh, I cannot really brag that I took this photo myself, because I didn't have many chances to see Sweden and Stockholm from space. Uh, but um, I did a few times, but never got this nice photo, which was taken a couple of years ago from the space station. But here you see most of Scandinavia, and right now we are around over here. Sorry, it was cloudy over Starso at the time. But, uh, and in addition to this night, we also see the aurora here. Now, I'm back home, where I come from Stockholm. Since uh, some years now, I'm working at uh, KTH, and uh, I am a director of the KTH Space Center, where we do a lot of activities. We are doing research from fundamental research, studying the astrophysics, electromagnetic field up to the building ele electronics and mechanics and rockets for, for going to space, using data from space for analysis. We also have a student satellite project. Uh, actually, we are not a pioneer here. Uh, Tartu University was one of the pioneering ones with a f one of the first student sat uh, small satellites. So this is the size, this is pretty small, but that's good. It really inspires students. By now, we're about around 100 students involved in this uh, for a few years. Because everyone wants to go to space, right? And there will be more and more opportunities to go to space. And if you don't want to go to space, maybe you can find a business opportunity for other, to send other people to space. And that's what we've been doing right now. 
There will most likely be four new companies sending people to space during this year. Shuttle retired in 2011. Since then, then there's been no vehicle from the US been able to send people to space. But now these two are ready to send these guys to space. This is the Boeing Starliner will be sending astronauts to the ISS. This is the SpaceX Dragon 9. And these guys were the first to be assigned by NASA to fly with these. And I maybe you recognize this girl here from over there. That's Sunny Williams, who I showed you before. And uh, of all these things, maybe the most interesting is this guy here, because he's not employed by NASA. So in the future, we'll be more and more people can go to space without having to be employed by a uh, national space agency. Chris Ferguson. He's employed by uh, Boeing, so he will probably be the commander of the first Boeing Starliner. Although, I must admit, though, he, he was a NASA astronaut. He actually was the commander of the last shuttle flight to l landed in 2011. So uh, NASA probably wouldn't have uh, assigned him otherwise. But, but I'm just saying th there are possibilities. And in particular, doing wh what I call small space jump, suborbital flight. That will be something which been, has been, t been talked about for a decade, in particular, um, Richard Branson with uh, Virgin Galactic has talked a lot about it. They only sold 700 tickets to do this thing. You fly with this little uh, space rocket. You go up to around the altitude of space, which is by definition 100 kilometers. Uh, you get three, four minutes of weightlessness. You do get the great view you from down on your land. The whole ride is about a couple of hours. And they had a very successful test flight in December. And one of the guys on that test flight was actually the same guy you saw there before who did a docking to the space station. That was the com my, uh, my commander on my second space flight. Uh, so he's getting back to space with this one now. The other uh, way to go to space as a tourist is with this uh, capsule here called Blue Origin. Uh, that's the name of the company, owned by Jeff Bezos, the Amazon founder. And that's this rocket that goes straight up, it's kicked off this um, capsule, which then makes a kind of parabola and then comes back in uh, with parachutes. And the rocket comes down like that, like, and lands vertically and can be used again within a day or a couple of days. Uh, so. These two companies will probably start to fly tourists regularly, uh, I would say, towards the end of this year. If you want to be up in space a little bit longer, just wait for the space hotels to arrive. Um, my guess is that they will be a reality in 10 to 15 years. And there are companies already who are uh, yeah, they're raising money or they have money uh, working towards that. Uh, m most well-known is Bigelow, uh, w uh, who is actually a, a, a hotel billionaire in the U.S., and he wants to move to space, uh, but also offer research possibilities. So this is how they foresee a future space hotel. Here's a space hotel designed by uh, students of mine. I have a course uh, at KTH with human spaceflight, and they all get uh, challenging projects various years. A couple of years ago, they designed this hotel, and they estimated that it would be cost about $10 million for a week in space to break even. And the interesting thing is that uh, a couple of years later, I saw a note where one of these companies doing the same thing. They also came up with the same number. Now, this is not only um, theory, paperwork. It's also being done in space, testing things. So a couple of years ago, this company Bigelow made a deal with NASA. NASA's very, actually, I would say, nicely helping all startups, and big and small, to get the chance to develop space activities. So they, the idea with these modules is that they're expandable. So you can kind of be m much smarter when you send things to space, when you send uh, modules to space. So it launched and docked to the space station. And here's kind of how it's launched. And then it's kind of getting expanded, and now it looks like that. And it's up there to allow this p uh, company to test their technology. But it also gives uh, NASA an advantage, because you always run out of <laughs> uh, locker storage room up on the space station, so they can use it to store stuff. NASA is also working in the old-fashioned way to build uh, big rockets, big stuff. And now there have been, for many years, 
developing a huge new rocket called Space Launch System, which will be as big as the Saturn V rocket to send people to um, the moon in the Apollo. And with this, they're building an Orion capsule, which will be able to take four people to the moon again. Uh, this will launch unmanned test flight with an unmanned Orion, first time probably 2021, and then probably two years later, people to around the moon. Uh, and uh, that part here is European. That's one of the interesting things. Europe is part of this with its uh, service module. And really, Moon is the next uh, goal after the International Space Station. And finally now people are talking about it, NASA is taking the lead again, and making plans. Uh, the idea currently, but I'm not sure that will have any really be that way, is to first make a small space station in a very far orbit around the Moon. Uh, that's called the gateway, or speed, deep space gateway. From there, you then start to make landings down on the Moon sorties, and then eventually start to build some kind of moon base. And the ESA general director of Werner has called it the moon village. Uh, and um, the last I heard is that the first uh, time NASA think they can do go down on the moon again would be 2028, and other, some people say, nah, we need to do it faster. Well, let's see. No one has been on the moon since this photo was taken. That was the last Apollo flight in December 1972. It's really time to to go back, and as you probably know, some people call this the space year, because uh, this is the 50-year anniversary of the first moon landing, 20th of July, uh, with Neil Armstrong. Then, eventually, you can go to Mars. You need to go to the moon to learn what we need to know before we can go to Mars. It takes a couple of days to fly to the moon. It takes, with today's technology, at least a year and a half to make a two-way uh, trip. So you need to know what you do when you go to Mars, and the way to do that, to learn and practice to go to the moon. And the best of all is if you can learn to use the resources on the moon. There, we found some water there. Can we use that water to make uh, rocket propellant, to make uh, water and oxygen for the crews? It will be very uh, helpful for the future, uh, and the future expansion of humanity in, uh, in space. So uh, thank you for attention. I don't know, I ran out of time as usual, so probably I don't have time to question, but I want to wish you really good luck, and uh, I'll go along and listen. I hope many of you have successful startup companies coming along. Thank you. Thank you, sir.